Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Wolfgang German. I'm the uh, head of German NGO Weltunger Hilfe. We're since eight years partners with Concern Worldwide and uh, IFPRE. This uh, exciting um, report. Uh, we really appreciate this partnership. It's something that uh, brings, I think, the community forward. Um, we exchange both academic um, results and uh, lessons from the field. And that's what both Connell and I will be trying um, this afternoon to bring in two case studies um, that illustrate a little bit um, why we think resilience um, is one of the key topics that need to be addressed when we talk about hunger and malnutrition. I also appreciate the, uh, the high turnout this afternoon. Um, I know you have exciting weeks uh, uh, behind you and probably ahead of you as well. Um, we've been launching this Global Hunger Index in a number of, let's say, political gravity centers. We've been in Brussels this week, in London, uh, in Berlin, in places like Ethiopia as well, Addis Abeba. We've been having in, in, um, incredible response, both in terms of the quality of the discussion and the appreciation of, um, I think, what has been, uh, what has been shown by the, by the overall community. Um, now I think my job is to find the um, presentation. Oh, I can help. Yeah, I was just scared to touch one of those buttons that bring the thing up and down. So, um, you've heard Derek talk about the um, the problems to define resilience. So we've put one on the um, on the wall, which is also part of the um, uh, part of the Global Hunger Index. Of course, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated one. It's not 100% congruent with what uh, maybe others talk about resilience. But I think one of the key issues in uh, community resilience is that it's not just a matter of bouncing back, it's a matter of bouncing back better. The idea is to bring the community into a position that is better than before a shock. Um, so it's not just recovering, it's, uh, it's improving the, uh, the situation. We have uh, chosen both Haiti and um, East Africa for particular reasons. Haiti partly because, of course, we do work there since about 40 years, um, um, but we haven't chosen it because uh, it's such a shining example of great work. It's, it's basically an example of how an entire nation, um, half of an island, and of course, subsequently, the communities and the individuals work on, uh, uh, live on, on this island are uh, subdued to uh, the high degree of vulnerability in all kind of aspects. And you've heard Ter Derek talk about the combination of both resi resilience and uh, vulnerability. What you see here up on the... Um, on the slide is, I think, a picture from last year where two major hurricanes follow each other within a few days. And, you know, we all know about the devastating earthquake in 2010, but you also need to know that just in terms of natural disasters, natural hazards, Haiti is one of the most affected regions of the entire globe. Uh, in the decade before the earthquake, before 2010, there were about 35 major um, uh, climatic or natural disasters uh, affecting this island, uh, 35, that is three every year, which, uh, and I'll go to the effects a little bit later, which is just one of the dramatic um, um, preconditions that people in Haiti have to uh, live under. Of course, we had the earthquake in 2010 where um, over 300,000 people lost their lives, 1.8 million people have um, become homeless because of the earthquake. And of course, it's, it's, it's a nation that also is ranking uh, among the lowest when it comes to stability of government and the ability of a state to address um, uh, problems. There's about 50% of people living in poverty there, and there's about 80 to 90% living of subsistence in agriculture. So there's very little kind of power to, uh, um, um, to really develop as an individual of a community. Nevertheless, uh, Haiti has improved over time, so also in the Global Hunger Index, from 35 to 23. It's still serious, but there's been significant progress over the years, over the decades, since 1990. So that's um, clearly um, uh, an encouraging sign, of course, slightly um, affected by the earthquake uh, in 2010, but then also the Global Hunger Index again improved after that. Um, what we have here is, um, again, the, the three, let's say, major factors of the resilience deficit or vulnerability, if you wish so, which is natural shocks, social political stresses, the widespread poverty and continuous food and nutrition insecurity, and then, of course, an emergency economy, an economy that has been 
um, made dependent on external aid, and not just, of course, by the aid community, which sometimes does the wrong things. The President Clinton himself has, has admitted that um, some of the, uh, the food aid policy has contributed to the dependency. But of course, a lot of, uh, if you wish, guilt is also attributed to the, um, the terrible, the dictatorial governments that have um, ruled and um, abused and exploited uh, the Haitian nations over the last uh, decades. Um, <clears throat> here's just an illustration of you know, the effects of some of the hurricanes that uh, um, came over the, um, the island. And it's um, as terrible, the, uh, the loss of life is, of course, the widespread crop disruption, 80%, 70%, 90,000 hectare, is, uh, is one of the major contributing factors why people are so vulnerable on that island. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult to withstand those shocks. This is um, another <laughs> um, factor that I hadn't mentioned in the, on the three um, um, major factors, which is the uh, environmental problems that the, um, that the island has. The island is almost completely deforested. Deforested. Deforested? Deforested. Um, thank you. Help me with the, the appropriate um, um, expressions. Um, you can see that. Um, you know, over the last decades, uh, the entire country has been um, made rid of um, uh, wood of timber. Basically, it has been sold. Sometimes it's the communities that cut down the remaining trees to get uh, charcoal, something like that. Um, this is the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And the border shows the problem. You know, on the one hand, you have, uh, you have uh, one of the poorest nations on the earth. On the other hand, you have a, a place where many people spend beautiful holidays. Uh, um, there is there's a lot of overweight obesity on the Dominican Republic. But it's also happening that uh, um, I've just told to, uh, spoke to a Haitian colleague of mine, said on the other part of the, on the other side of the border, the Dominicans are protecting, they're protecting the forest with the, by the army. The army is actually taking care that natural resources are being protected, which I find is a quite interesting phenomenon. Um, there's also a little bit of a relationship between the Domin Dominican Republic and Haiti in a way that some of the arable land in Haiti, which the smallholder farmers cannot sustain because they don't have the money for the agricultural uh, implements or whatnot, are now being in large um, um, numbers being procured, being bought by investors from the Dominican Republic. So, you know, the large issue of uh, foreign direct investment or land grab, however you want to call it, it's happening in small scale uh, there as well. And what is happening, the investment comes in the country, uh, these farmers sell their land, uh, they lose their jobs, they maybe get a day, day job or so, but again, you know, they're, they're, they're losing, losing, um, losing a little bit uh, more of their ability to withstand any kind of external shock. Um, here's what we do. Of course, we did work around, uh, and we do work around Port-au-Prince and the west, uh, uh, southwest, where the earthquake has struck most. But the northwest of the uh, uh, country I want to talk about, which has no direct, had no direct um, um, impact by the earthquake. Indirectly, yes, because uh, dozens of thousands of people migrated from the south to the north in the aftermath of the earthquake. This is one of the uh, ways to cope with vulnerability, you know, not just adapt, but transform their lifestyle. They, le they left their home. They were looking for a job up in the north. Um, this is an area which is, again, it's been deforested. It's, um, it's vulnerable. Um, and we basically launched a large-scale food and nutrition security program. I'm not going to go to all the components, but what you see basically is a program that wasn't designed to create or improve resilience. It was a classical food and nutritional program. And it had a number of um, uh, factors, um, road construction, protection of watershed management, for instance. It was addressing, in the, you see that in the middle uh, role, both uh, um, income and health issues, but also the stabilization of the environment by natural resource management. Um, and also, also, we were trying to adapt the program in the aftermath of any kind of emergency um, uh, that, that came uh, to that region, uh, be it hurricanes or uh, droughts or even the, um, the immigration or the uh, migration of um, affected earthquake victims. Um, we had quite an impact, actually, over the years. Um, um, we managed to um, 
uh, reduce the food, food deficit uh, during acute crisis, you know, the uh, crisis that uh, Derek mentioned, you know, by about 30 to 50 percent. We increased household incomes by up to 200 percent. We had about 5,000 households that were able to improve their um, um, food security in a substantive manner. Now, we looked at the program through the lens of uh, resilience because it wasn't designed originally. And we looked at what are the key ingredients that really contributed or maybe that, uh, that we forgot about. Um, and I'm mentioning just a few. Um, addressing the root causes. Um, what we have here is um, an example of a number of things we did. A lot of infrastructure, you know, you see irrigation systems, you see uh, um, uh, protection against or erosion, and of course we were trying to improve the uh, food security of the farmers by distributing improved seed varieties. Um, this is an example of how we uh, both involve the communities in um, you know, uh, working with the effects of a disaster, but also prevention of disasters, which is riverbed protection you see on the left-hand side of, uh, um, of, uh, of the slide. Um, a, th a third one was a serious effort to strengthen the community's capacities, but basically by uh, building up uh, local watershed management and natural resource management committees. Uh, which basically on the mid to long run could become the nucleus of an organized rural civil society, which is better equipped uh, to uh, collectively mitigate risks. And the fourth one is collaboration with local government and national ministries. You see those four ingredients in the hunger index, in the global hunger index. The collaboration with the government is one of the key issues that must not be forgotten. And in a place like Haiti, of course, a government that has been weak and has been weakened by the earthquake, it's, it's one of the even more important ingredient. Um, the outlook, uh, it's not looking terribly uh, bad, actually. We're trying to strengthen the civil society further. I think there's a lot of opportunities to foster resilient, enhancing policy changes, um, because what we think is it is possible to improve and increase the, um, the ability of a community to res resist shocks, uh, even in a place like Haiti. Thanks for your attention.